it's very rare that you have someone that is not only the best athlete in their sport, but arguably the best coach in their sport. And that's what we have with John right here. And so, John, I'd like to go to 1988. What happens in 1988? Well, it's uh, obviously Olympic year, and, um, you know, you had an opportunity to fulfill a dream from an early age, you know. And my, my, my first uh, real impression of the Olympics was in 1972, and we had a wrestler in the state of Oklahoma named Wayne Wells. And he went on to win an Olympic gold medal, came back, and I can remember being at the parade, shaking his hand, visiting with him. And it became very real to me that this was possible because you had someone in your own state and uh, winning a championship. And of course, in 88, uh, had the opportunity to make the team and went on and won my first gold medal. And, and what's unique about John is Adidas actually designed a shoe around him. And after that, after you win the gold medal, money starts to flow in, and talk about the negative impact that money had on you. Well, it, exactly, you know, and, and after that, uh, I was a world champion in 1987, and, and I was able to do that while I was still in college, and then when I won the Olympics um, in 1988, of course, the experience was uh, what you thought it would be. The opportunities came, and, and a lot of things happened. And my first comp competition back from 1988 uh, of course, the Olympics at that time was in August, and my first competition was in 1989 in January. And I went down to Cuba for a tournament, and I lost. And it was the way I lost that just kind of really frustrated me. And I made a commitment then that if I'm going to continue to wrestle for the remaining four years, and world championships being three of them, and, and of course 1992 being the Olympics, um, I needed to set some standards for myself, and one of the things I did was I took, I lived on $1,000 a month for the rest of that, my career. And I just made a point that if I'm gonna train and try to be the best, um, I need to put myself in that atmosphere where it allowed me to do that, and, and living um, minimal was important to me and really made a difference to stay focused. And so you consolidated you lived in a one bedroom, yeah. right? Dri dr didn't drive that nice of a car. Nope. Which and you know, it just it just made things a lot simpler for me. You know, it, it was it wasn't uh, it wasn't something I wanted to do. Um, it was something for me that those those type of sacrifices that you might be making or you think you're making, um, you know, it gives you your edge. Those are the things that gave me an edge that you know that. Um, I'm, I'm, uh, I can't go somewhere every weekend. I can't do these things. I got a thousand dollar budget. Um, and it just kind of kept things real simple for me and understanding that my training was first, my mind was first, my body was first, nothing else really mattered at the time. And it's interesting because you, your training schedule, you were working out at unorthodox times to gain a mental edge. Can you explain that? Well, you know, you, you try to make workouts, you're working out two times a day and you're focused on, you know, being successful. And I just think you've got to create some things around yourself, you know, that, that gives you that mental edge. And for me, you know, something I did for, for over five years is, is I'd set my alarm at, at two o'clock in the morning. And the, the great thing I had was I lived real close to Gallagher I have an arena. Um, I was uh, uh, half a mile from it, and it was easy to walk over there. And I would go in, and I'd set my alarm, and, and at 2 in the morning, I'd go to Gallagher Iber Arena, and I'd run stadiums um, three, four nights a week. And that was the same time schedule the Russians were on. Exactly. And, and just to strengthen my mind, I was thinking, you know, while the Russians are sleeping, I'm working. And for that reason, you know, you start to build some, some real energy within yourself. And I, I think that, you know, the challenge of somebody that, that wins a championship in any sport, the challenge is always repeating, you know. And here I am uh, after 1988, I'm a two-time world champion, one of them being an Olympic gold medal. Um, where do you go from here? Well, 
I'm, I'm 22, 22 years old, and I just didn't think my career should be ending like this. So if you're going to go another four years, you know, winning the silver medal wasn't an option after winning two golds. And it just kind of drove me to a new level. Um, and I had to create those uh, things in my training to make sure I stayed motivated, kept my edge, and recognized that when you're on top, uh, it's, it gets harder, it doesn't get easier. Well, and it's interesting because one of the best things that I learned from John is you talked about how you go so deep into the process that you start to find answers that nobody else can give to you. And that leads to a lot of self-trust. So John had a, a different body type, and after winning the gold and putting himself into that regimen, you discovered a move, and what's that move called? Low single leg. The low single leg, okay? And that's taught all over the world. So when you see the ripple of that, what does that do to your, your self-trust and your thought process? Well, you're, obviously it's, it's flattering to be able to see something develop and, and continue to develop. I mean, what I did and, and how I hit it in 92, um, all over the world, they've, they've added to it. And, and watching that develop, um, you know, it's, it's a proud moment. But like you said, you know, you do go into a deep process. And, and a lot of times that's a lonely process. It's not, it's, I don't think it's a, a process that's danger for you. Um, it, it, it becomes a little bit harder to come out of that process when you complete your, your career as an athlete. And of course, I went from being an athlete, uh, winning my second gold in 92, to straight to coaching. And you were, you were thinking about quitting. No question. I was, uh, it, it, took, it took me two, three years of fighting to try to figure it out. And it's, it wasn't something I had to do. You know, I think it became a little bit competitive that I need to figure this out, not just for the success of the program, but I just think for myself, you know, so you're in that deep process for six years of trying to maintain being the best in the world. Um, it's not easy to come out of. It's, it's a self-centered world. It's, it can be a selfish world. Um, and then all of a sudden you walk in and you got 40 athletes and they got problems and I'm going, you're not motivated? Uh, you don't go to class? Uh, I didn't get it. You know, and... Um, I think that's one of the things though that, that speaks to John is, is his ability to adapt. And you said to me that obviously success can be poison if it leads to, to complacency. But you told me that with the money thing, that because you've grown up in a household with 10 people, 10, 10 siblings, and the closer you could live to that lifestyle, the better off you'd be. And can you talk about how growing up with 10 siblings helps you have a solution-oriented mindset? because everything's kind of survival mode. Yeah, and, and it's a competitive world, you know. You're, you're growing up with 10, uh, 10 in a family. Um, getting a hot shower was a challenge, you know. Um, you never had a pair of underwear. Um, finding a pair of socks was impossible. Um, I was the seventh uh, of 10 born. Um, and when you're the seventh of 10, everything's competitive. You know, you're growing up in that environment where you know, truly, I mean, if you didn't get up early enough for breakfast, um, you may not have breakfast. Um, Ride homes? Coming home, you know, if, if uh, your practice was extended, you end up walking three miles from, from your workout room back to your house. So um, the one thing that, that I did have is it was a strong, faithful-based family um, that lived right, um, that cared for each other. Um, but it's very competitive, and and you learn to compete when you when you're born seventh of ten. It, there's no other way. You got to compete every day. For like I said, I mean, we giggled at a hot shower, but you know that was important. You know to set your alarm for six a.m. and and you're you're busting your ass to get to that shower because you know everybody else's alarms are going off, and um, you know we'd lock the doors. I we. There was times that my sisters blew through the door because, you know, they're trying to get in there. So um, it was a good world. You know, I mean, some people would call it dysfunctional. Um, <laughs> uh, 
but uh, you know, there's nothing dysfunctional about it. It was healthy. It was competitive. Uh, my parents had their hands on us, and uh, of course there was fights and there was uh, tournaments every night in the in the uh, in the living room. And um, I didn't I didn't start winning tournaments until I got in about ninth grade. You know, I could go all over the state or all over the nation and win anywhere, and I couldn't, I couldn't beat my sisters in my own living room. Yeah. And, and so I think the best thing that we can learn from John is here's a guy who is the Michael Jordan of wrestling and the Phil Jackson of coaching. And he has every right to have a very convicted mindset that this is the way. And yet you continue to evolve. That's why you're here. And it's a pleasure to hear from him and how he adapted. Let's give him a hand. Thank you.